Welcome to Let's Go Live. I'm Gigi Mar, and I have with me young adult high fantasy author Amelia Ramos Samper. So welcome. I'm so excited to have you on. I know we were rescheduled from I think you're on spring break before or something like that. Uh yeah, I was on um yeah, I was on spring break. <laughs> and aren't you gearing up for the end of school? Do you guys finish this month? Uh yeah. Oh, we finished it. We have a uh, final <clears throat> next week, which is really crazy. And I, I'm definitely not prepared for that, but we'll see how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> and if you don't mind me asking, what grade are you in? Uh, I'm in seventh grade. Oh, okay. So next year you'll be like ruling the school. Yeah, I guess so. Well, I live in, so my, my school's like all the way up to high school. Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah, so still, still a little while, but it's really funny because we're just, we're walking and then there's just these giants, like all these giant high schoolers, because I'm pretty small, I'm, I'm, I'm not too tall. Uh, and so you just, I'm just walking and then all these high schoolers are like bumping into you and they're like three times my size. <laughs> that's so cute though. Well, that's good though, that you're gonna go to the same school all the way through. Yeah, it's gonna be fun. I love Palmer, it's where I go. Um, if you don't mind me asking, what part of the country are you in? So I'm in uh, Florida. I live in Miami. Oh. What about you? Where are you located? I'm in Houston. Ooh. So we have like this. Okay, you're way cooler because, you know, my, the whole Miami scene is just great. Beautiful beaches. We have like the sludgy water that comes out of the port of Houston. So, yeah. <laughs> but our climate's similar. Yeah, the climate is similar. I went to Houston a little while ago. It was fun. My sister is uh, touring colleges. And she came here. Houston. Uh, where where do you want to, I don't remember, but she, yeah, she went to Houston to do her college. Well, we do have five universities, and some are great. Some are, <laughs> mm, don't come. <laughs> okay, so I have to ask you, I've been so curious. I've kind of, like, stalked your profile <laughs> or your Instagram. So please tell everybody your name, where you hang out, your handle, if you have a website, and definitely show your book. Awesome. Sounds like a plan. So, uh, hi, my name's Emilia Ramos Samper. Uh, so I'm, I'm Colombian, so that's why my name sounds like that. <laughs> and okay, say, say it again. Emilia Ramos Samper. Okay, that's so pretty. But you had, I think, did you roll an R? Emilia Ramos yeah. Samper. Yeah. You, that <laughs> sounds beautiful. beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and then obviously when I'm talking to all my very American friends, it's Amelia Ramos Samper. <laughs> Amelia. Um, yeah. <laughs> so. Oh. <laughs> I really have to like enunciate it for like a slow people. <laughs> yeah. So I am 12 right now, but I wrote my debut novel when I was 10. So it's called Kind of Scares and Wonder, and I have it here to show you guys. Yeah, let me pop up my camera because I was using my book to pop it up, and then I realized that's probably not the best strategy. Uh, if I want to show you guys the book. So this is my novel. It's called Crown of Skills and Wonder. Uh, and and it's, it's teen fantasy. It's about dragons and war and dark magic and all the things I really loved. I'm actually right now, like just as we started the live, I was working on uh, the, because I just got the edits for my second novel, the sequel to this one from my editor. So I was working on that right now. Okay, so I have a million questions. So um, okay. first is, you're very busy. You know, you're in school. I'm sure your, you know, studies are important. They come first. So where do you find time to not only like write, edit, do all the marketing, but also then, you know, promote book one and to turn around and do it again? Uh, well, yeah. So time management's a really big struggle for me. I have a Girl, whole Google Doc. For everybody. Huh? For everybody. Time oh. management. Because <laughs> I have to deal with school and everything. And so my parents, they've always been big on, like, education is super important. And it's the lighting of a fire. And so I've always tried to be very on top of my grades. But with writing things, it's hard. Like, I'll be on my computer. And then my teacher is going to be like, what are you doing? Do you have something more important to do with class? And I'm like, I have to turn in my manuscript to my editor in tomorrow. And I forgot to do it. <laughs> so... And then they just stare at me like, I guess you did have something more important today. <laughs> okay, so that was a question of mine. Do your, uh, does your teachers know? Like, do they know? How much do they know? Do they support it? Um, 
Yeah, most of my teachers are pretty good about it, especially the English ones. Oh. Um, some of my teachers, I don't really like to broadcast it too much, especially when my friends are around, because I know they can be a little bit iffy about it. Um, because like <laughs> your friends, weird. like or your teachers, my <laughs> friends. Oh. So, because like I don't like to say it in class, because most of the teachers find it really cool, but when I tell students that I published a book. It's sort of like they all they're always asking me questions about it. Yeah. And I feel like it's weird with my friends because like a lot of them have read my book and it's really sweet, but then it like they go from like being friends to fans and it's odd. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I would think that would be a great thing because you kind of have a built in street team and I know social media, wow, y'all's age group, y'all <sighs> nail it. You know, like when you get to be my age, we don't know what we're doing. We just get on and like post embarrassing stuff and hope we kind of get it. <laughs> yeah. So Instagram has been like pretty tough on me. Like I usually, so I have this thing with TikTok and I was like, I'm not going to do a TikTok because if I do a TikTok, then it, it'll be bad. And then all the girls from school are going to like cyber bully me. Um, mm. And so I was like, I don't want to do a TikTok. But then mm -hmm. I finally got convinced by my like friend who's sort of been my social media guru. Uh, his name's David. He's really sweet. Um, shout out to David. Yeah, shout out to David. <laughs> he, he doesn't have Instagram, but yeah. Um, and so, uh, and so he finally got me started on TikTok, and I've only been on there for like a week, and I already had one of my videos go viral. I have like 600 followers. It's so much easier than Instagram. It's crazy. Oh, yeah. I, I read somewhere that, you know, well, someone said book talk is dying, but I don't think that's the case. I feel like uh, TikTok is a new Instagram, Instagram is a new Facebook, and Facebook is like, dead. <laughs> it's the new LinkedIn. <laughs> it's a new LinkedIn, or it's the old MySpace, I can't decide. Oh my god, I remember MySpace, I only know of MySpace because like, I was like the generation that got like, the glee, like the resurgence <laughs> of glee. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's why I know what MySpace is. Well, congrats. Congratulations on that viral TikTok because that's a big deal. Uh, yeah, it was. I mean, it's not viral. It was only like twenty thousand views, but like still pretty. Only twenty thousand <laughs> views. You know how many authors would kill for twenty thousand views? It was my. It was the second reel I've ever posted. It was crazy. Nice. I, cause like a lot of people go really crazy over the over like me being so young. Yep. Um, so whenever I post like inspirational things, like I did one, so there's like this trending Hamilton sound. It's like, why do you write? Like you're running out of time, right? Day and night, like you're running out of time. And so it was just like, like little clips of me editing and then writing the book. And then at the end, I like zoomed in on my computer and then out on my, on the actual book. And people found that super fun and interesting. Okay. What, what is your handle on TikTok so people can follow you there? Cool. So it's my full name. It's Emilia Ramos Samper. So the, the same as my website. My website's also emiliaramosamper.com, and I had to get the whole domain name because Wix is annoying. So all officers out there, don't use Wix. Find something cheaper, please. <laughs> okay, so to tell us about your first book, and then tell us about the second. Okay. Oh, and before you do that, and, you know, I interview a lot of fantasy authors, and so the terms young adult or high fantasy, they can kind of mean different things to different authors. So what do those terms mean to you? Yeah, so for me, mine's tech, it's on the younger side of young adult, um, like gearing more towards teens and tweens. Um, so I usually say like teen fantasy so that people don't get confused because YA a lot of people mostly like I've just been reading YA since I was in third grade so to me I just thought it was something that like you read from like 10 to 12 turns out it's supposed to be for teenagers um, it's wide it's a very very big genre. yeah mm -hmm. so I always say teen fantasy so that people don't get confused. <laughs> um and so I absolutely love writing fantasy it's my passion and then I use high and epic fantasy to sort of mean the same thing okay. because um, my book here, there's like a map that I created. Did you right make it? Here. I did make it, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, oh my gosh, that is so good. <laughs> thank you. Did you draw? Yeah, I have a bigger oh, one on my wall. I did, uh, well, I did, I did like, um, like an app. I like drew it on an app for Mac making, cool. which is fun. Yeah, so I have, I have <laughs> on my wall, I'll show you guys in a bit, like a massive thing because this is the small scale. This is just one country and I like built out a whole world. So I absolutely love, that's sort of what epic fantasy means to me. Like 
having a culture built in, not just having like magical elements, but the book being set in a completely different place. Like I'm always super careful about the, uh, the expressions that my characters use. Like I never, like, I never say like, like, God darn it, or like, oh God, or any of those things that sort of takes it out of the, the realm because these people have different religions than we do. They have different beliefs and different expressions. So I always find that super interesting. Well, I do read some fantasy, and they say the gods. The gods, yeah. So I guess it really depends. I say the gods because so some of the characters in my book are religious. Um, that's going to be more in the third. Sorry, my dad just walked in. I was telling him to leave. <laughs> um, and so, uh, yeah, so I try and be pretty good about how I use my um, expressions. I've heard the gods a lot, too. I use that sometimes. Yeah, it's really, and I think it's um, kind of like a neutral zone, right? I feel like nowadays things are so divisive. I mean, my gosh, <laughs> you can't see anything because, like, for every yes, there's no, and you're just like, okay, everybody, just everybody calm down, okay? I just say, I oh, gosh. Like, yeah. I feel like when you say the gods, it kind of gives you a little leeway, right? Mm -hmm. For the, and it appeals to those readers that are religious and not religious. Exactly. Yeah. Like, I remember um, in Percy Jackson, because mm -hmm. it was, like, the first series I really fell in love with. And they always said, um, like, curse the gods. Yes. And so for, like, my entire, like, third and fourth and fifth grade, like, elementary school life, um, I would say, like, oh, gods or any of those things. And I went to a really curse Christian school. So they would get mad at me. They would be like, they would be like, why are you saying that? And I'm going to be like, because I read Percy Jackson. And they were like... <laughs> So that was fun. Okay, so in your fantasy trilogy, um, it's called The Air of Fire, right? Uh, the Shadow Air. Say that the again. Sh shadow Air. The sh Shadow Air. Okay, I don't know where I got that from, but I did look it up. And so you have a trilogy planned for it. Yes. So with that, this map, you said is one country, but Will the whole trilogy take place over like multiple kingdoms or multiple lands? You kind of like lay out how your world is without us even knowing it yet. Uh, cool. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. So the first book takes place in a kingdom called Valestine, which is the one right here in the little map for anyone new joining in. Um, so it's called Valestine and it has a bunch of different parts within it. And so that's where the two main characters are from. And that's also where dragons, like the race of them, is originated uh, in this world. But there are also other countries. So in the second book, we have a country called Tashiki, which ends up being super important for, like, world building. And they have these things. They, they like, sort of play with the concept of time as magic, mm -hmm. which I, I love to play with because I always found that super interesting. And I didn't like the way it was done in a lot of books. So I kind of wanted to rework it in my own way. And then also there are other countries here. I'm going to show you guys the map. Heck yeah. Here's, okay, I have a question while you're getting it set up. Here's the map. If you're doing time, are you doing time travel? Is that what you mean by you like to play with time? Um, so they're called, it's in the second book, they're called time gaps. So pretty much, um, the, I'm going to try and do this without spoiling the best I can. Uh, yeah, the main works. character, um, one of the POVs, one of the new POVs, for the second book, her name's Amethyst. And she uh, has sort of an ability to play with time, but she also has like these visions of like the future and the past, but she can't control them. Someone else is controlling them. And then that's only revealed at the end of the book. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, so I wanna talk about your wall, but in one moment, because um, it is so cool. I love Thank visuals. You. Visuals are just like, ah, I to know, die for. I love making maps. <laughs> Okay, so will your book two then have its own map since it's, it's going to be its own country? Uh, yeah, so they also travel. What I wanted uh, to do is to use the map that I already have of Valestine, okay. and then for each book slowly start like zooming out as if it were like a lens. So it'll show Valestine and the neighboring country. And then after that, and then for until I get to the third book and it shows all of them, all like the entire continent. I mean, well, would, you, would you convert that into like art, you know, because fan art and fantasy is huge. 
And people, yeah. like right now you have it on your wall, but could you create, I don't know, something that you could sell that has like the whole yeah. world that you created? That would be awesome. Yeah. I love, I always see, um, a lot of times I'll send my book. Uh, I remember it was the sweetest thing ever. I sent my book to a bookstagrammer, uh, a review copy, and she really, she loved the book. She uh, had a five-star review, and then she was also an artist. And so her name's uh, Belza. Bell's a bookstagram. You guys should all follow her. She's great. And she, and then she sent me art. She was like, oh, your book got me out of my, uh, like, my artist block. And she, she sent me this picture that she made of my main character, this, this art. And it was just the most gorgeous thing ever. And I love it so much. I also love playing around with AI art for my books. I only use them for, like, marketing and websites and things because I don't want to use other people's art because, you know, copyrights and everyone's intellectual property. Yeah. Okay, so... <clears throat> I interviewed an author two weeks ago, and her name is Lena Ravenhill, and you've got to look at her Instagram. She is a fantasy author as well, and she uses AI, and her page is stunning, and she's redoing her book cover. She's doing it, but they're beautiful. I mean, they're so eye-catching, so when you said that, I know AI is fascinating, but again, one of those divisive topics, like people yeah. either love it or hate it. It's like either like, I love it, or people are coming with like torches and pitchforks. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so that's got to be the ultimate compliment though, right? Like as authors, we create these worlds, these characters, and these stories. And when people go on the journey with you and get to the destination that you plan, that's a huge compliment. But then to go a second step and create fan art, how does that make you yeah. feel? I know, it was, it was just the sweetest thing ever. Like, it warms my heart, my soul, my everything. I uh, I don't know, because you have your book released too. Have you ever gotten fan art for that? No, but I'm a dark romance. Yeah, so I'm different. a dark, yeah, romance author. But I do have people that have created mood boards and you're just like, oh my gosh, they get it. Like they get my characters, they get why they react the way they are. Um, I know that we try and have character arcs, but some people are just unredeeming or they just won't arc when you want them to arc. Exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> uh, I just, it's, it's the best feeling ever when you get, um, when you just feel like your character is represented. And even if like, you always look at it and it's always a little bit off from what you had in your head. But I think that's the magical aspect of it, that everyone views their characters a little bit differently. Like one of my really close friends, um, she actually read my book, uh, even though I, tr I tried to tell her not to, but she read the book and she really liked it. Um, and she, one of my main characters, it says it a million times that his hair, his name's Ez, um, that his hair is like jet black, like slicked black, like silky black hair. And for some reason, she had it in her head that his hair was pure white. Really? I don't know. It's funny how like <clears throat> everyone sort of sees the personalities differently. Actually, just now I realized that all my characters in the first book have brown or black hair. Maybe I'm just uh, <laughs> projecting. Are you biased? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I just I always see all the characters have blonde hair, and I'm like, we need some representation <clears throat> here. Oh yeah, and I think too, what's interesting is I. You know, it, it's hard because you want to give enough description, right, so people get it. But there's a lot of folks that want to imagine the character their way, and they don't want a whole lot of description. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so interesting how, like, everyone's a little bit different. Like, I've always been in the opinion, I try to find, like, a happy medium. Like, I give some core details, and I try to give, like, more, like, sensory information, I guess. Like, yeah. information about how their looks are perceived by others rather than like exactly what those looks are right um because i feel like that's a little bit more helpful yeah. so that you can show sort of how their looks affect their character and their psyche overall like scars or like their their bone structure i don't know but that's always really helpful like a lot of my characters like some of my characters have like softer jaw lines and they're just have like a warmer face overall while others for example as are like really hardcore like scars weathered by the world and it's sort of it's fun to use looks to represent the character oh yeah because it speaks to like what they've been through you know there's an old saying that um we wear life on our face and so i think that's true when it comes to characters yes but does, does 
your series, how much magic is in it? I know you said that she has, um, she can't necessarily control time because that's controlled by someone else that we find out later. But what are there, is there a magic system? Did you create it? Does everybody have it? Are they humans that have magic? Or are they completely magical beings? Uh, so in the second book, it gets a little bit more crazy with like the time and everything. But I guess for the purposes of love, of this, I'll try and just stick with the first book. Um, so there are three main types of magic. There's one type of magic that's like sort of like an avatar, the last airbender, and it's only in one type of region, which is like the elemental trap territories. And depending on where you live, they have like fire, water, air, and there's one more. I'm literally blanking out with my own book. This is hilarious. Uh, but it's people only from that region. So only from that region. If I go that visit that region region i don't inherit the powers it's only if you're no from it's like bloodline okay yeah and then so but that's like a really small community and there's like there's only like a couple hundreds of people that go there um but like the more important type of magic so there's like main sorcery which is kind of the generic like everyone can use it like healing spells just very basic um can be learned but it's not anything strong and then there's the most dangerous type and oh there's also dragon magic yeah. which can only be found in like pure blood dragons not changelings which is um as so he can transform between dragon and human um and then there's the most dangerous type of magic and the one that ends up being the most important which is the one that naomi has she doesn't know she has it at the beginning of the book um and it's transferred by bloodline and it's dark magic and it's really really dangerous and pretty much the way it works is that you can control your own shadow oh. so you can use your shadow uh yeah so it's it's a fun little writing thing and i I really love working on it. Okay. Where did this come from? Like, where does all this is so creative? It's so, Thank you. you know, to create all your different magic systems, who can use it, how they can use it, why are they limited, kind of like the boundaries and rules around it. So where did all this come from? It's so fascinating. <laughs> yeah, well, I did a lot of research on magic systems, mostly from reading, and I found it really interesting how it works. I also... I wanted to incorporate magic in my book because I really liked the idea, especially specifically shadow magic, that magic isn't always pretty. Like yeah. it's not this, cause I've seen a lot of books where it's like, obviously the hero's arc and the journey and they didn't know they had this magic. Um, but I wanted to make it less of a blessing and more of a curse. Mm -hmm. Like for Naomi, it's not something she can control. It's not something she wants because it's sort of a reminder of the parts of her that aren't so pretty and I've seen that done in a couple of books and just not the way I imagined it and I really wanted to see it done with a character that was just so kind-hearted but they had this part of themselves that they needed but they were just so ashamed of. Is it trainable? Like I, even though when she discovers she has it and it's dark, does she harness it? Does she try and you know or does she just avoid it altogether? Because you do see all of that in fantasy. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so for, for my character, for Naomi, she tries, she learns how to use it in certain senses, um, mm -hmm. but she only uses it like when she absolutely has to, because the only person, at least in this book, the only person she knows of that has the same magic as her is her mom. Mm -hmm. And her mom is a little, she ends up being a, the antagonist of the story, and she has a really dark past with all the things that happened to her. I'm actually working on a prequel for the mom. Her name's Miranda. She's awesome. Okay. Uh, I love writing. Did your mom know this? Is she like, you're not talking about me. What, what do you mean? Wait, can you feed that? Sorry. I said, does your mom know this? And she's like, uh, you better not, not be talking about me. It's okay. Because I, I also, the dad also is a little bit of a martyr and a, also a little, um, <laughs> so it's okay. I like slaughter. Like I, I slaughtered both of my parents in heart. So nobody is safe. Yeah, the sister's also bad, so, <laughs> oh, well. Yeah, because I, I always saw, like, the Walt Disney things about how he had, like, parent issues and, like, trauma, and how, like, that's why no Disney character has, like, a good family relationship. But I guess in my case, I love my family. They're the reason why the book exists. Uh, I would go and read, it, read a new chapter to them every day during dinner uh, while, like, COVID and everything. <laughs> And so I guess I kind of made the mirror opposite of my family. 
Well, I mean, that's good though, but you're right. Like Disney is always just like mm -hmm. the evil stepmother. The dad is always mm -hmm. gone. And you're just like, can we get like a healthy family structure up in here? Anybody? Yeah. Okay, so you published book one in 21, right? Uh, yeah, I think so, yeah. I don't know why, there's like a lag now. Huh. Can you hear me? I can. But I think... Okay, I can... It's so strange because your lips move. Oh. But the sound comes later. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can you hear me i can hear you okay it's just the video is a little bit off okay oh wait maybe it's syncing back up all righty okay. okay so you have published um the first book in 21 and was that when you were writing it when we all sat home with covid and we were bored yeah so i was like because COVID was really crazy for me because I couldn't see any of my friends. And I'm like a really active kid. I love doing everything. I'm so social, uh, which is good for a writer because most of my friends that are writers are very introverted, but I am not. I am like all over the place. I love talking and being social. So it was really hard for me, just kind of that world that I had with all my friends and everything. And it was just sort of taken away. So I mm -hmm. always, I always say that like, like when I couldn't go back to the world I wanted to, I made my own. And that was what my book did with me. That's why I was writing it. I love, love that. That's a good way to look at it. Yeah. I mean, you know, I hear from a lot of introverts who are like, oh my gosh, it was great. COVID was the best <laughs> time for me. When my extroverted friends were just, you know, had mental health challenges because we're not mentally be that isolated. So I've seen both sides of the spectrum. Are you so, an introvert or an, or an extrovert? Okay, so it depends on who you ask. I'm like a friendly introvert. <laughs> but I surround myself with people that are like, have the personality of you, really outgoing, <laughs> love to meet new people, love to share ideas. And because I love it, honestly, like I have opinions about everything. I don't want to hear my own. <laughs> exactly, yeah. My friends are I, pretty different from me. Yeah, I think that's what makes it so great because if I had friends like me, it would be super boring. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And so I have a lot of friends that are high energy like you, and they're just delightful, as you are Thank as well. Thank you. Thank you. That's so sweet. So on book two, you said you just got your edits back. So congratulations on that. Thank you. When did you write it? Roughly how many words is it? And how long does it take you to write it? You know, because you got your coursework too. Uh, like. Yeah, so um, for writing, it usually takes me about six months. It depends how, like, coordinated I am. With the second book, it was actually, for the first book, it took me quite a while. For the second book, it was crazy because we were, <laughs> uh, we were up in the mountains. We love going to the mountains as a family because I was born in, in Colorado. And so that's I a little tradition we have. And it gives me so much inspiration to be up in the mountains, a lot more than, like, being at sea level. I don't know. It's a weird <laughs> thing, but I like it. <laughs> and so I actually cranked out my the second book in like three weeks while we were up there like almost the whole thing no way. And then, but then I realized it was like 40,000 words <laughs> and that was way under genre so now I'm working with my editor and we have to sort of make it we've gotten it to 55,000 but the ideal is like 65 so we're, we're gonna make it there what was your first um how long, how long was my first book mm -hmm. it was it ended it ended up being 60,000. Yeah, and don't you think that that first book tends to be bigger because there's so much world building and introducing the characters? Yeah, yeah, it's pretty interesting. I'm like, I struggle a little bit with blank room syndrome. So okay, for me, it's actually- Say that again, blank what? Blank room syndrome. <laughs> okay, what is that? I've never, I've oh, never I've never heard of it. No. Yeah, I hadn't heard of it for a while for a while. I'm really familiar with a lot of writer terminology just because I've watched so many YouTube videos on writing, like more than I can count. Nice. <laughs> um, and then I've also done some like little master classes and things. But blank room syndrome, pretty much what it means is that 
um, when you're writing, like specifically with dialogue scenes, this happens a lot to me. And then there isn't much description. So your audience sort of loses track of what's happening like outside. And it feels like they're in a blank room. Like it feels like, like the, there isn't enough description for the audience to be placed. So it's just things happening, but like it has no setting. And so that was a lot of the reason for my calling me. <laughs> and yeah, so that was, that was my so short. Okay, so is that when you were getting so much dialogue? What do you mean? Is that when you had the blank room? Like where in your writing process does that occur? Uh, yeah, it occurs. It occurs quite a bit when, when it's dialogue. So when they're having a scene that's very, like, usually a fight or something that's very dialogue heavy. And then I have to, like, be very careful to the tags and things and pay attention that I'm not, like, exposing too much in dialogue. And I'm very focused on, like, the flow of the scene. That it's really hard to add description without ruining the flow of the scene. But then I look back at the scene and someone else reads it. Or I read just someone, they're like, wait, where were they? Where are they at? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that's a good question, though. Do you write your first draft where you just get the idea out and then you go back in subsequent drafts and then add what's missing or the, you know, more descriptor or your dialogue action? Or... Mm -hmm. What ends up happening for me is that I try, I try and make a pretty good plan before I start everything. I love plotting things. Um, I have, I don't know if you, <laughs> when I was, Showing if you saw, I have all these little your cards with like characters and arcs. Wall. Yeah, my sticky wall. So I absolutely love having everything planned out. I have like 50 pages of character profiles. Um, and so I try to have everything very planned out, but it does take me a lot of editing to go back because a lot of times when I plan something, my, my initial plan and what actually ends up going on the page look really different. Yep. And yeah, like I look at it and I'm like, wait, that character arc is not coming through. So that's when I need like an editor and a cup and some beta readers and some friends to sort of help me fill in the gaps. Okay, so that's a good point that you make. How deep is your plot? Because plotting can be challenging too. Yeah, so for especially for the second book, more so than the first one, um, it's very complicated because so in the first book there's two perspectives and then the, in the second book there's four POVs and it, the plot itself that's why it's so hard for me to like keep a focus on my characters because the plot specifically for the second book uh, and a bit for the first book too is really crazy being epic fantasy there's a lot that has to take place and there's just a lot of really wacky things going on and so that's I the plot like is a very micromanaged like that's one thing that I've actually never gotten really notes on, um, like obviously small things, because I'm very, very planned out because it's epic fantasy about exactly how my plot flows so that there aren't any inconsistencies. Well, and it's true because I find like fantasy to be a much more difficult genre to write in because you do have all these subplots, you have all the storylines. There has to be like, Typically, there's like one interaction that's so minute, but it builds on it later and you got to remember it. So what kind of system do you have, you know, to kind of capture all the Easter eggs and to capture all the loose ends to make sure you're continuing them? Because I, I would imagine your character pages and your sticky walls may not encompass everything. Yeah, so I have, so I use the three X story structure for a character specifically, and then I also use, um, I also have the slides, like Google Slides, like exactly what I use to turn in on Google Classroom to do my school presentations. And I have a bunch of photos, I have a different like collage of photos for each chapter, yeah. and I plan out all the plot points for each chapter, um, and then like how it connects with everything. And so that's, that's like super helpful for me because every time I'm, I'm writing a chapter, I look at all the plot points and then I look at the chapter before that and the chapter before that. And it's like cleanly blocked and planned. And so that helps me so much, my peace of mind. <laughs> okay, so if I can recap, you basically have a mood board in Google Docs or Google Slides. And then you have bullet points for the mood board also of your plot points. Is that right? Yeah. 
That's so creative. Now, I have a question though. You have it all plotted out. But like you said, sometimes your characters don't follow it. Or sometimes there's just magic that happens, right? And you didn't even know it was going to come. And you had no idea. So where does that go? Then do you go back to the Google Slides? And does it throw your whole plot points off? Do you fit it in there? Do you stick only to the plots that you, you know, kind of like pre-planned? So I'm like, I'm very spontaneous and I like to add things um, while that are like, so what I'll do is instead of editing the manuscript, I'll edit the, what I've already written before, because I think there's, there's a magic about writing, about adapting things as you go. And I feel like if you, that's why I like to have it um, digital. Like that's why I like to have something digital because it feels changeable. It feels like I can move things around and I can make them work with the plot and it'll still be good. And that, that's really nice. And I love, I love that I can do that too with my story. Well, I mean, as writers, we're always looking for like tips and tricks and ways that people, what works for them, right? And I love sticky walls. I love, you know, when you have your index cards and you have a three act structure and you put them down. But you're right. Sometimes you get them all lined up and then the magic moment happens and it is hard to adapt because you're like, uh, now I've got to rewrite the last 50 index cards or stickies. Like, I love the visual, but at the same time, you're like, ooh. Exactly. Yeah, it's really hard because you want to have something like beautiful and, yeah. and usable. It's and fun. Beautiful. Uh-huh, it's great. And then you change something. Like, I remember in the second book, there's a side character. Her name's Heather Queen. And she was completely out of the blue. Like, I was just, I was editing. Uh, no, not editing, sorry. I was drafting it. And I was like, this is missing something. And then mm -hmm. I started brainstorming for, like, this girl that had, like, fiery red hair and, like, a very vibrant personality. And I just wrote a chapter about her. And I really liked it. And then... I kind of had to like adjust everything so that it would work, but I'm really glad I did because like I love her so much and she's so close to my heart. Yeah, I mean, see, that's awesome. And that's what I think that's what storytelling is about, right? Like when you're in that world, spontaneous things happen. And as a writer, you have to decide, okay, do I kill this idea or do I keep it? It may be harder on me as a plotter, but it's so good. I don't want to let it go. Oh, yeah, it's crazy. It's like, ah it's you have this beautiful plot and everything planned out and on paper and then you have an amazing idea and you don't know you're like it's like what you should do and what like your creative author heart wants and that's why I think that's where our stories get richer I have um, a few I have well I have a several developmental editors and then my regular like you know copy editors and so your dev editors are always like no stick to the plot but, uh, uh, you know, and it's so hard, right? Because sometimes those are what makes your book so much better is the unexpected. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And I mean, I always find it, um, whenever I'm reading books, I try and think about it like if I were approaching this book as a reader, what would I want? Because I think character arcs and all those things, they're like the base. Yeah. Character arcs and plot, they're, they're the base. They're what every reader doesn't know they want, but it's what they need. Yep. Um, like I, I didn't realize how important it was until I read a bad book. Oh, um, yeah. there's, yeah. there's some yeah. out there. There's some out there. <laughs> I didn't realize how important it was to have like character arcs and all that until I had to read books for school. Not great. Oh. No. Some of those books are really bad. Oh my gosh. You know, this is, okay. I'm going to say something very controversial here, but, um, I have children and they're reading the classics and I'm like, Oh, <laughs> These are some really, not only are they incredibly racist, I'm like, why are we still reading these things? I know. <laughs> but the writing is just like, oh my gosh. And so they're like, but they're the classics. Yeah, it's just, I know. But for me, it's not even, because like, I'm a professional writer. Like, I've been writing books for two years. I have like three books, one of them published. I have a published short story. I have a couple like award-winning short stories for competitions and things. Awesome. And then they make me read these novels that are meant, I swear, they're meant for toddlers. And it's just insane. Like the school reading system is. Oh. <laughs> I know exactly what you're talking about. We know when you see the syllabus, you're like, who, who picked this? 
Is there like a committee I can get on? <laughs> I know, it's just, oh, like, uh, I understand that, like, you have to cater towards, like, the people that have a harder time reading and everything. Yeah, but, yeah. like, as an author, some of these books just, like, hurt my heart. <laughs> <laughs> okay, do you, do you annotate and then write how you would fix it? I, I probably aren't doing that. Yeah, I write, like, sad faces. Like, I draw little sad faces okay. in the book. When I, when I don't like something or we, we have these crazy discussions, like for my essays, it's happened to me so many times that they've like taken off points. Like I've gotten eighties on essays because they're like not enough creativity. I'm like, what did I do? I hated the book. And then one time I wrote an essay on why the book was so bad and I got a hundred. Oh my gosh. That's hilarious. Your teachers are probably like, can you stop being a professional author and just be a child in my classroom? Yeah. Oh, it was the funniest thing ever because like, <clears throat> English class and like author life don't always click. I remember yeah. when I was writing my first book, um, everything was like perfect, like five sentence paragraphs, like super clean cut, gorgeous. Like my English teacher would love it. And then my editor was like, no. This is horrible. Yeah, she was like, like fix this. And I was like, but why? My English teacher said it was good. And she's like, you're not writing for academics. You're writing for kids <laughs> and teens. And they were bored. Okay, so I have um, a beta who told me, she said, this character, you need to have to have more contractions. And I was like, what? And she's like, this character doesn't use proper English. They use contractions. So why aren't you using that like everywhere, every page, every time she talks? And I thought, oh, okay, well, that was so insightful. So to you, you know, like we don't use contractions, right? Because they're like, academia hates them. But yet, she was like, this character doesn't read that way. They don't speak that way. Exactly. Yeah, that's happened to me so many times. What I always thought was super powerful for me is because my character, especially um, in the second book, then we get to having four POVs, um, but also in the second book, there's, a, a, but also in the first book, there are two characters in the second that are like rich, they're wealthy, they're nobles, um, they're royalty, and then there's two that come from really poor backgrounds. And so um, what I heard from some of my beta readers and from my editor was to play around with the way they use contractions and with the way they like curse. It doesn't flat out curse, of course, because, um, you know, it's a book meant for kids and teens. Yeah. So I try to avoid that as much as possible. Good also, I'm 12 and I really don't appreciate it. Good. Good. <laughs> um, and so it's super important for me uh, that I plan out the character voices, like Ez, for example, who comes from a poor background, who's been like go eating for scraps all his life, he uses a lot more contractions. He uses um, like dirtier language, like he doesn't talk in a proper pretty manner, whereas Naomi, who is raised as a princess, even though she's a little spunkier and a little spikier than most princesses are, she speaks very proper, even if she doesn't notice it. Right, like he may use the word ain't, and she would never use the word ain't. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So book two, you have back from your editor. Mm -hmm. So how long will it take you, do you estimate, to rewrite? And how do you feel about the rewrite process? Um, yeah. So I've actually, I've never had a full-blown rewrite. Usually it's more like, um, like adding. Okay. So that's what's always been nice for me because I tend to have blank room syndrome and I tend to be way under the word count <laughs> that it's always been like adding more to the character arcs, like creating more depth and richness within the story, which I, I'm very glad that I've never had to cut like any major aspects. I remember there was this one chapter that I only wrote it. It was in the character. It was literally in the perspective of a monkey, one of the side characters. Okay. Yeah. Because so there's like a little monkey, his name's Miko. Um, and I was originally going to kill him off in the third book. And then my friends, like, they all yelled at me because they, he's their favorite character. Yeah. And so he's, he's still going to be alive. Um, <laughs> and so, and so my editor was like, you have to scrap this chapter. This has no relevance to the story. It's told in the perspective of a snow monkey. Yeah. But I really didn't want to cut the chapter. So I ended up putting it as a bonus chapter at the end. Like after, after, now I wish I'd used it as like an anchor for my newsletter, but oh well. <laughs> I know, but don't you think you can write another bonus chapter? I mean, people, readers love bonus chapters and then to give it away on your website, 
People just yeah. want more and more and more of the world that you create. What I've been doing that's been working really well is that I've been um, putting up the first three chapters of mm -hmm. the second book. So that like anyone, because I try and make the books like pretty cohesive so that even if you haven't read the first book, you can still sort of understand the the second book without having to read it. I remember one time I was called, it's a book called The Oceans Between the Stars and it was the sequel to a book called First Day on Mars. You see, that's a book you should read in middle school. It's a fantastic book. And I remember that I absolutely was like thrilled when I read the book and then I realized it was the second book. I'd missed a whole first book. <laughs> and so that's what I love about series and that's why I can't wait to have the second book out. I'm so excited. Okay, so when are you targeting? Do you have hard deadlines or is it when you get to it? Because now you're heading into summer break. So does that mean you have more time in your schedule? Yeah, I definitely have more time. I'm going to try and finish up with the edits by um, summer break. I do want to have, because I didn't have enough time to pour into marketing for my last book, mm -hmm. which was really a shame because I wish I had been able to market it better, which I'm Hopefully, we're getting better. So I Girl, want to marketing quit. is its own. I mean, people get degrees in marketing. I know okay? they're like special people in this world. Like marketing is just like magic. We can't really touch it. You think you're doing the right thing? It pays off. It doesn't pay. I don't know. Like <laughs> every author I know struggles with marketing. I know it's just it's. Ugh. But when I was little, I kind of had this, like when I first published my book um, two years ago, I had this rosy tinted view of life because all I'd heard about is like these authors from these big publishing yes. companies. And, um, but I couldn't fit that into my schedule. Like being a 12 year old author, you can't work with a major publishing company because they're working with professional authors. They're not working with people that go to school full time, people that do theater. I also do theater professionally. Um, so I, I just finished up a run of, frozen at area stage which was crazy and fun and now i have post -show depression but yeah so that really <laughs> that really kind of stopped my ability to be able to write so for me but all i'd ever heard about was these major publishers and these authors that like once they published a book massive as long as it was good it was just a massive success yeah. but i didn't realize that you had to market and so it was only like in recent months that i really kind of got my game on and like made my Instagram professional and created a TikTok and a Pinterest and all these things so that I could get my book out to people because I, you definitely know this as an author when you love something with all your heart and soul when you put all this work into it and you know that it's something that people will enjoy yeah. you want to share it of course and so that's the thing I mean that's why I started these let's go live because there are so many really wonderfully talented and creative people out there you know, you're in that category and we just don't get that visibility. Mm -hmm. And I find it fascinating. I love talking with other people. I love talking to bookstagrammers and bloggers. And I feel like this interview forum is such a great way to get to know people, to spread the word, you know, like this will go up on my YouTube. It's also on my podcast. It'll go on my website. You'll have um, rights to it as well. So you can do whatever you want with it. Right? Yeah. I've done but a couple other lives so what I love to do mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll tag you in and then we can do a collaborator post if you'd like um that I make like a, a cute little trendy highlight reel which does really well and then I also do like a bigger one that's like a multimedia post that usually doesn't do as well um but like the reel it's like it's really fun because I have like all the highlights of it and then since it's like short form content since people have the attention spans of goldfish I saw <laughs> it, that I love doing that for for lives okay teach me <laughs> I'm, I'm all ears, yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> you had talked about all your edits are going to happen over this summer, ideally. Um, are you going to the mountains, and will that inspire you to do book three? We so book three. This is actually funny. Book three is written. <laughs> what? Um, yeah, and with book three, since it ends up being like six perspectives, because I add to each, each book, um, it ended up being around like 80,000 words. So I had the opposite problem. Oh my God. I had the opposite oh. problem. Um, it was, so yeah, book three is actually already written. So I've had book two and three sitting um, like in my Google Drive for a really long time. And I'm just, 
I've been working on, on them patiently. And book three, it's been there for a while because I like to keep, I don't know if you do this, I like to keep my drafts, like I like to tuck them away for at least six months before I look at them so that I can look at them objectively. Yeah, fresh eyes. Because if not, it's just really hard. But also because I'm like growing up so fast and I'm just in that area where things are constantly changing, a lot of times I'll see these things and I'll be like, wow, that's so kiddish. Like even, um, mm. it just, it feels like, because right now I'm, I'm like a teenager, I guess I'll, I'll be 13 in like a week. Uh, Happy birthday. <laughs> thank you. Um, so it's really crazy to see how everything changes, like especially with the romantic subplots. Mm -hmm. um, I, everything just slowly, slowly changes. Because when I wrote my first, like the, the, my first romance, which was as a Naomi, that like, uh, it had like a cute little kiss scene. And it was really crazy to me because it was just sort of the way I imagined everything to be because I'd never felt something like that. And then now like actually having had like, you know, one of those like fleeting middle school relationships, I still kind of love the little romance that I built. Like I, I still think it's, it's true to aspects of love and I still think that it's, it's wishy and wonderful in, in that sense of things. Well, that, that speaks to your ability as a writer, you know, like we don't always have experiences in what we write. You know, so you research it, you read other books and that, <clears throat> you know, like maybe like category or other books that have had that experience. But, you know, I do write dark romance. Oh my gosh, no one wants the experiences I write about. Yeah, exactly. Right? But I think when you can write something that, you know, you did before that you had that experience, just speaks to how great of a, a writer you are. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so I have to know, how do you write book three before you write book two in a trilogy? No, so I wrote book two, and then oh. I wrote book three. Okay, I was like, how in the world do we need to <laughs> writing hacks? <laughs> yeah, no, that would have been, that would have been crazy. Um, what I am looking forward to is sort of jumping back and doing the prequel, because I keep putting all these little Easter eggs for things. Um, that ended up being super important in the trilogy, but like I know there's like a deeper layer, like there could be something else in there, and that like ugh, I love I love the characters, I love the villain Miranda, and then I love he, he's dead. Um, one of the most important characters, his name's Nikolai, but I have this vision of who he is in my head as like this cocky twenty year old boy, and like I want to write it so bad. I don't know has that ever happened to you with your characters that are like dead or like older and then you just like imagine how they were when they were younger oh so my de debut novel um there's kind of like a big fiery explosion at the end so you know it could go both ways right if you know if you watch enough like soap operas or telena telenueva telenovelas telenovela. say it again telenovelas telenovelas <laughs> i'm getting it all wrong <laughs> But they always bring everybody back from the dead, right? Yeah. And so I'm like, he's the one that I've had people say, is he really dead? Can he have a redemption story? And what would it be? And I'm always, that's the one, like you said, they're like, they're dead or they're, you know, they're older. Like, do I want to bring him back? And I just <laughs> don't know. I find that one fascinating. So like you, he just hangs out in the back of my mind. <laughs> but I don't know. Yeah, it's weird because this is a character that he pretty much affects everyone mm -hmm. in, in one way or another. And he's I, probably the most controversial character in the book because, like, there's an entire race that just sees him as, like, this hero. And then she, like, Naomi, um, since she's his daughter, sort of sees him as, like, this, this untouchable figure. Like, whether, like, there's points where she hates him and there's points where she loves him more than anything. And it's just, like... Because she only, the only memory she has is those of, of her father is those that she had when she was really young. And so I love writing characters that are rosy tinted in the eyes of the protagonist. Because I think it's just really special and really magical to have that view of them. Well, yeah. And what's cool, though, is you can play off that because sometimes that flawed perspective is so fun, right? Yeah. But are you thinking with this guy that you would write <clears throat> the story of how he became that way? Mm, I mean, I would write, I would write it a little bit more on the romance side. Mm. Um, 
because their like romance and sort of all the screw ups that happened with um, Nikolai and Miranda, which are Naomi's parents, are pretty much the reason why the book is shaped the way it is, and the reason why Naomi is the way she is. She's like a, a little bit of a mix of her of her parents, and so I think it, it would be really sweet to see kind of the way both of them were wired when they were younger and to see the way Miranda, why she became as horrible and evil as she is. Um, I love doing that. Really. And then also Nikolai, sort of how he became a rosy tinted hero while really being flawed, just as flawed as Miranda was. I think your readers would love that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. But would it come after you release book two and book three? Yeah. Definitely. Well, you said you already have those written, so you just have that you could write on the side. Do you have a release date in mind for book two? Um, so I'm thinking, I'm thinking around like February of next, like February of 2020. What's next? 2024? Is that next? <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. So I think probably around that time, maybe a little sooner. I just want to make sure that I can build a, a good platform for the book. So I'm not sure. Oh, to have a longer marketing period, right? Ah, that makes sense. And then would 20, uh, so would you publish the third book in 25? Yeah, I try to be, I would try to be better about it than I was with the first book because I waited way too long. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it, it's going to make the second book a lot better and it's going to make my marketing and my author platform better in general. Yeah, yeah, because you have more time mm -hmm. and more um, build up. Yeah. Okay, so what is your favorite part about the whole author process in writing and your least favorite? My favorite part would have to be plotting. Like, I have two. Probably plotting because, like, that surge of ideas just coming to your brain. Mm -hmm. And then also planning. I mean, and then also drafting. Those little sections where, like, you're just so excited and, like, things come and everything's perfect. And then my least favorite would have to be, I don't just marketing count. Yes. <laughs> the okay. whole author so, journey. <laughs> I like marketing would probably be my least favorite, but I think editing beats it out because marketing has that whole aspect of like connection, like doing things like what I'm doing with you, that yeah. like you get to genuinely just talk with people mm -hmm. with like authors who people who have shared interests. And I think that's really special. Yeah. So I'd have to say editing. I love my editor, but editing is just a pain and it's hard. It's just really hard. <laughs> it is hard because you get you know, you appreciate the value of editing, but man, when you get it back, it, sometimes you're like, whew, I don't even know where to go. Like, I really want to change. I know I need to add it, but like that creative part of your brain hasn't fired or doesn't really know how to incorporate it yet. Exactly. Yeah, it is hard. Okay, so planning, do you, do you then... Well, I'm going to try to say, do you write your scenes out of order and then put them together? Or do you write linear? So I, when I'm planning, my scenes are way jumbled. Like a really crazy, wacky dream. And then I have to like put them together. But when I'm actually writing, like drafting, I, I don't know what it is with my brain, but I have to do it linear. Okay. Like if I do scenes out of order, I'll write snippets out of order, like specifically snippets of dialogue or snippets of description. But I can't like write one scene here and write one scene here. Because it's, like, yeah, because my characters, they have like all like very specific relationships. Like I write for my first book, it's enemies to lovers. And so like what I try writing it out of order because some people are like, oh, it's super cool. It helps you like... Um, be more creative with your writing and then I realized that like all the character relationships like their growth d doesn't work if I don't write it linear I, I don't know what it is no I know I find it fascinating how people can do that they're like oh I just wrote this scene and that scene and they they use Scribner and they'll rearrange all the scenes and stuff I'm like what how does that make sense it's crazy Crazy, yeah. I, I've I've seen a lot of things on Scrivener. I don't think my I'm technologically advanced. I always joke because people think that like when you're my age, um, then like social media and like technology just like sort of comes like super easily. Yep. But I am not a techie person. Like I ask my brother for almost everything. Um, I'm like, can you please help me? I don't understand this. <laughs> um, for like all my technological issues. But one thing I pride myself on that I can help all of my friends with is that I know in and out 
every single feature of Google Docs. <laughs> okay, is that where you write then? Do you write? Yeah, I don't know. Like, because I know it's like the least effective thing, and like everyone uses Word and everyone uses Scrivener for writing, and everyone's like, you have to, you can't use Google Docs. Like, that's for kids. And I'm like, but I love Google Docs. <laughs> well, the thing about it is, is Google Docs is always available. It goes wherever you go. You don't lose your work. You exactly. Know? Mm -hmm. What do you, what I do you think it, I don't think it much matters. I think it's just whatever works for you. You know, like, I'm older than old. And so Microsoft was like the only thing around. And so we all use Microsoft. And so I have friends, author friends that use Scribner, And they're like, oh, it's a learning curve. I'm like, girl, I got too much other stuff to learn. Yeah. I'm not worrying about my word processor to write. So if Google Docs works for you, shoot. Yeah, like, go. I'm not going to waste time on a learning curve for a, for like a, <laughs> a work. I don't know. Yeah, maybe you wanted that for that time for learning like mid journey or for your AI, you know, or for, I don't know, TikTok and stuff like that. That's the stuff you're like, I'm going to save my brain power for that, not my word <laughs> processor or how I write my book. Exactly. Or formatting. Do you have a format or do you do it yourself? No, I, I have a formatter. Like I said, my my technology just does not go that far. So my, um, my like, my line and copy editor also does formatting. Nice. It saves my life. Because my, um, so my dad works in business and my mom works in hotels. Mm -hmm. So neither one of them, like, can do anything with technology. It's funny because my dad works in business for telecommunications, but he works in, like, team building. So, like, he literally works in telecommunications and has trouble getting on the Zoom. <laughs> it's, it's just, it's, it's too funny. That is so cute. Okay, so... Where do you go from here? So you have it kind of plotted out, 24 release, 25 release, you'll write the prequel. Are there going to be any like side series or any spinoff characters? Because you love this world that you've built so much. Mm -hmm. I think maybe, possibly, like I have, I always have floating ideas for it. Um, but I think I also would, I really like sci-fi and I like dystopian like more recently <clears> as a older so i would love to sort of branch off and do something like that like something with like a really cool kind of like think like thinkable like discussionable i i'm not even saying words anymore um <laughs> premise and so i i think i'd like to venture off into something different because i do love this world with all my heart and soul and i love the characters but i think as like to grow as a writer i want to like venture outside yeah try a different genre do you have ideas? Do you journal your ideas? How do you brainstorm? Or do they just come to you? Or how does that work? I have a little Google Docs folder called Plot Bunnies. Um, <laughs> yes, it's called, it's plot, called bunnies. plot Bunnies. Um, with, and then I'll just be like on a hike or something. And, and I'll like write it down. Um, and it's just like a bunch of bullet points. I don't think anyone on earth could understand what they mean except for me. Like yeah. one of them's like architect, historical, like archaeological, time travel, black plague, beauty and the beast, like mask. A little <laughs> from like the from like the 2020 remake with Emma Watson. It's like Emma Watson. I don't know. It's just like whatever comes to my mind. Mm -hmm. um, but they're really random. But then I go back and I look at some of them and like, huh. That's pretty cool. And so I have a lot of ideas there and hopefully one day I can look back, like when I have some more time to write, I can look back and plan. Okay, well, first of all, that Beauty and the Beast remake was so good. I Sometimes, know. Right? Oh, it was so good. But I love her. I feel like, does she make a bad movie? Emma Watson, no. No. I love She's Emma so Watson. Good. I was, um, I always like, I saw myself as Hermione Granger. Mm -hmm. Like, I would do the accent and everything. Because as I told you, I did theater, so I was dating Mary Poppins, so I would just listen to Emma Watson. I would watch the movies, and I would, like, nail the British accent. Okay, so do you have a um, wizard? Do you have all your wizardry stuff in there? Yeah, I had, I had a ninth, for my ninth birthday party, I had the Harry Potter birthday. We turned the the like we turned the whole bottom floor of our house into like a harry potter thing um and we got all my friends and we had like robes and wands and um i had a little cake that said for happy birthday to she who must not be named 
that's why oh, I love that's so it. cute. Because all my friends, it was like the constant bore, like the war, like Harry Potter or Percy Jackson. Harry Potter, Percy Jackson. <laughs> and then here I was like having Harry Potter birthday parties and dressing up as Annabeth for Halloween. Like I was just in love with both. I mean, they're good. And I mean, that Harry Potter franchise, oh my gosh, if you could like blueprint and follow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Harry Potter's great. I love Harry Potter. Um, and then obviously there's been some like controversial things with JK Rowling and things, but I feel like separating art from artists is such a controversial topic. Well, and I don't even know any of that. When I was reading it, I was just like, I don't even know how I feel about it because I feel sometimes the media, you know, they put their slant left or their slant right. And I'm like, okay, can I just get like the facts and I all yes. decide? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause it's, it's always very like <clears throat> lanted. Like it's hard to find things that are hundred percent true. Oh. And then like not having Twitter, like you can't see these tweets, right? Like you can't see exactly how it went down. So I think, if we had an artificial being that could just tell us exactly how things actually happened and then we can make <laughs> our decisions, that would be. Yeah. Um, so do you have time for a few more questions? Uh, yeah, maybe a couple. My, my mom just sent me a little text. She was like, down for dinner. That's, I think that's what my dad was trying to do when he barged in. <laughs> that was a long time ago. Okay, uh, we'll, make this, we'll make it super don't, fast. It's rapid point, It's good, our parents get it. <laughs> Okay, the microwave it, I guess. Okay, rapid fire, paperback or e-reader? Uh, both depends. If I'm traveling, I do Kindle. If I'm at home, I buy paperback. Do you annotate them or no? I annotate only school books because I think annotating has like given me trauma <laughs> from like these school books. <laughs> like yeah. it's given, it gives me stress. To, to like, because I only ever did it, I was only ever forced to do it with like school books. So now like, if I annotate a book, I can't enjoy it because it reminds me. Yeah, it's not fun anymore. They took that picture of the fun. Okay, plotting or pantsing? Uh, plotting, 100%. First person or third person? Third per person deep, so sort of in the middle. Oh, okay. Um, do you write past tense or present? Um, I write past tense, but if for short stories, I write present tense. I have a little problem with tense switching. I do it way too much. My editor's always looking at my work and she was like, pick a tense, girly. <laughs> I think we all do. And then when you're trying to move time forward, right? So if you write in present tense and you're like, well, yesterday I did, and everybody's like, no, you can't write yesterday I did this. And you're just like, okay, but. Or like, especially, I write third talk. person deep because I have a lot of perspective. So like to keep it but like I use a lot of character voice. And so like when someone's like always doing something, like she always does this, it's like, wait, does that? Like you break, you break the past tense. Oh, it's just, ugh. what do you write in past or present? I write um, first person deep present tense, but there is a lot, like I'm writing my fourth book now and it's a second chance romance. So you do bring in all that past and it can't be like, flashback after flashback you know those get annoying so i don't know what my editor is going to do i was like that is all her problem exactly yeah Ooh. plot driven or character driven uh, uh character driven okay. i i always think that like characters shape the plot yeah is what i would say i'm the same way hey give me a good character and i'll figure out where she goes yeah exactly i feel like because a lot of times especially with epic fantasy there's sort of this belief that like you have to um like you have to have this incredible plot and then the characters just sort of move around the plot but i think that's how bad books are made well i think too a lot of fantasy people expect there to be like a lesson learned mm -hmm. you know what i mean they're like oh i didn't learn anything from this you're like well it's not a, like a manual it's just for <laughs> fantasy you know but i think there's a lot of people that mix that up mm -hmm. i think there's like like you, the character has to grow and there has to be like a truth or something that you want to convey like a, a message yeah. from the story but like you're not reading a kid's fable book like it's not always going to be tied up nice and pretty yeah yeah exactly okay we agree <laughs> okay writing alone or writing with a partner or writing sprints so, so 
I try and write alone when I can, but I love, I have um, a friend, she came on the call in a little, like a little while ago at the beginning, but she had to leave. Um, Emily Words in Books, Emily Words in Books. Uh, she, so she actually read my book and then she's also, she, she wanted my advice because she's a, she's a teen writer, she's 13. And so occasionally we'll do writing sprints together. So nice. she lives um, like on the other side of the country. So we, we have to like plan it out so that we're both out of school at the same time. Yeah. And so we're like, we usually do it on weekends and we'll do little 15 minute writing sprints and we'll talk chat about our work and our works in progress and and so that's really sweet that is it keeps you motivated right definitely and sometimes when you're stuck on a scene you have someone just right there to talk about it and then you're like oh my gosh you fixed it boom i'm back in i know no, it's oh it's the best yeah. thing ever okay um outline or discovery writing um outline but a little bit of both that's what I was thinking, because you said, you know, like, all of a sudden magic will happen and you have to go back and rewrite your Google Slides. Yeah. Okay, write in silence or write with music? Um, r listen to music that inspires me. I have a little playlist, and then write. While, while it's going on or no? Um, no, not while it's going on. Okay. Um, writing with a deadline or at your own pace? Um, Self-imposed deadline. Self-imposed. <laughs> Series or standalone? I think you said connected series, though, didn't you? Uh, yeah, series. They're, they all happen one after the other. But you said if someone picked up book two, they could probably read it as its own book, right? Yeah, they would be a little confused at the beginning, but it's pretty, like, I like to include little clues so that you wouldn't be completely lost. Okay, got it. Okay, historical setting, present day, or future? Um, I don't know. It's more historical with, like, a little bit of present day things. But it's very magical. Well, because in fantasy, do they have the technology? Do they have cell phones? Because I've read some fantasy where, you know, like, they're humans, they have magic, but they don't know it. But they still have technology. And then I've read some fantasy that they're more historical where they don't have all the modern conveniences. Yeah, they have like technology fueled by magic. Like it's all connected to the magic system. It's not, it's like a different form of science, I guess. Okay, gotcha. And that is why you're gonna write your next series in sci-fi. Yeah, I wanna uh, uh, branch out. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, it has been so nice getting to know you. You are just so inspiring. I mean, to have all this, That means that we're done. <laughs> yeah, I have a puppy too. I have a dog. <laughs> so sorry about that. No worries. Okay. Well, I wish you a great, um, great on your finals that are coming up next week and early happy birthday. Bye.